Hi, my name is Andra Alexandru and I'm here in London to interview Lord Watson of Richmond, a member of the House of Lords on UK foreign policy issues. Lord Watson, I would like to ask you first, what is your view on UK's policy towards the European Union in the light of the recent developments related to the Treaty on Stability, Coordination and Governments, which the UK did not sign? Well, first of all, I regret the fact that the veto was used. Uh, after all, it's been British policy in the European Union to enlarge the European Union to its present numbers. And at the end of all that, we were isolated and we were the only country that actually opposed. So I think that was unfortunate. There were, however, good reasons for it. And uh, let me just try and briefly explain them. First of all, um, the City of London is a hugely important part of the British economy. And uh, in fact, the British economy is inconceivable without the role of the City of London. So in a sense, what manufacturing is to Germany or what agriculture is to France, the City of London is to Great Britain. And we were nervous uh, that the regulations which were being proposed would penalise the City of London and would make it more expensive for uh, foreign investors to use the city. Uh, we weren't incidentally only worried about our own position. We were also worried that if action of this kind was taken, the transaction tax, uh, it could mean that quite a lot of financial transactions would switch away from Europe altogether to either New York or Singapore or somewhere else. And that's why the veto uh, was passed. But this is not the first EU initiative that, which would have meant giving up even more sovereignty to EU institutions that the UK did not approve of. In your opinion, can the current UK foreign policy in, in the EU be seen as a form of protectionism from the Eurozone difficulties? <laughs> well, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, as I've explained, uh, one of the motives for this latest this veto uh, was to protect the City of London from regulations which could have had a negative impact upon it. So yes, that is a form of protectionism. But I think the fundamental UK position is, um, is, is something different. Uh, the whole European Union idea, closer and closer, ever closer union, was born of the results of the Second World War. And in particular, France and Germany, which had both suffered in different ways from the Second World War, both had been defeated, both had been occupied. Uh, they were determined that nothing like that could ever happen or would ever happen again. So in a way, they were suspicious of national sovereignty. And the other countries took a similar view. Now, Britain's experience in the Second World War was completely different. Um, a lot of people lost their lives, there was a lot of damage, but Britain was a victorious power and she was not invaded. And therefore, the British instinctively have a trust in their own sovereignty and they don't wish to see it compromised. Now, the final point I would make on this is that although, therefore, Britain starts from a quite different place in terms of European integration, uh, we start with a different outcome to the Second World War. Um, we've arrived at a rather similar place. I think we do fully accept that European integration is something that is in certain sectors absolutely essential, in the environment, for example. Uh, also, I think we, um, uh, we basically are willing to share sovereignty around certain areas. But as I say, there is still this reservation on the part of the British. And one final thing, you see, we don't have in Great Britain a written constitution. We have a parliament and we have the crown in parliament. The whole of the European construction is about treaties and about constitutions. And I think instinctively the British are suspicious of constitutions. But will the fact that the UK is not part of the new club within a club affect its national interest in the long term? Well, I think, again, that's a very important question. And I think we have to be very careful about that. Um, to this point, 
Britain has not been excluded from any of the really important decisions. And even though we're not a member of the Eurozone, or for that matter the Schengen Agreement and the various other agreements, as you know, um, <clears throat> I think we feel that we are at the top table. <clears throat> there is within the European Union a very important relationship between London, Berlin and Paris. And that's not an accident because those three countries taken together uh, have a majority of votes. Um, and that's an important element. So I think Britain will be very careful not to lose its position in that trio of the three largest member states. Well, uh, in the last few weeks, the media have been speaking of a two-speed Europe. Do you believe this scenario is inevitable or is it happening as we speak? Well, there clearly are different dimensions to the European Union. It's not just the Eurozone. And, uh, I mean, you've always had a fundamentally closer relationship between the original six members of the European Union and the countries that join later. Um, and so the reality is that there are different dimensions to Europe. But your question was about speeds. Now, that, of course, uh, implies that we're all moving in a certain direction and that we move towards that goal at different speeds. Now, I'm not sure that there is a single goal. Uh, I think Europe is a fact. Europe is uh, essential to every member state's position in the modern world. But I don't think we're heading in one single direction, for example, to become a United States of Europe. <laughs> that would have been uh, another question of mine. Um, if, from your perspective, the idea of a United States of Europe would be a viable option. Because some, for instance, even the president of Romania supports this idea. Well, I think it's a very difficult concept. It's sometimes called the concept of federal union. And, of course, the idea is, the moment you say United States, that somehow this is going to be rather like the United States of America. Uh, I don't think it's like the United States of America. I believe that the European Union is its own being. It's unique. It's not like the United States or like China or like anywhere else. It is what it is. And Europe is characterized by not just commonality of purpose and commonality of interest, but it's also characterized by diversity. Linguistic diversity, cultural diversity. I mean, you come from Romania. Romania is very aware of its own different identity. And so is this country. And so are the countries within the United Kingdom, Scotland and Wales, as well as England. And I don't, I don't want that to change, actually. I think that our diversity is... Uh, part of our strength. And if you look at um, the American Constitution, for example, um, its, its, its motto uh, is that they are a single entity. From the many, a pluribus unum. From many, one. Well, we have a pluribus <laughs> and we have created this different relationship between states, a new relationship which I believe will have great influence in, on the future of the world and will be copied in some ways elsewhere in the world. But it's not, we're not copying the United States, no. Coming back to the relations between London, Berlin and Paris within the EU, um, considering that lately France and, and Germany have been dominating the decision-making within the EU, do you believe it is necessary for the UK to change its foreign policy towards the Union? Well, you see, I don't really accept that France and Germany are dominating the decision process in Europe. I mean, if you really think about it, the policy of the enlargement of the European Union, Britain was always the strongest advocate of that. Now, some people said um, the reason Britain wants a wider Europe is that it doesn't want such a deep Europe. And there's some truth in that, perhaps, some truth in it. But I think the diversity of Europe will become increasingly important and Britain, in a way, 
uh, represents that as well. So even though we uh, will seek to have this relationship of equality between Berlin, Paris and London, we also have separate relations, of course, with those countries, but we also value enormously the relationship that we have with other countries within the EU. Um, going from this, um, there is also an EU common foreign security policy, but at the same time, each member state has its own foreign policy initiatives and interests. Do you believe the common foreign security policy is still relevant and would it have potential to further develop? Oh yes, I think so. And um, I think you can already see this. For years there was a rather sterile argument actually about whether there should be a European common defence policy. And Britain kept on saying that you mustn't compromise the NATO relationship and you must be careful of the relationship between Europe and the United States. The French, by contrast, were very keen on the idea of having a European defence force in some way, and they believed that they could persuade the Germans to go along with it. But the reality is very different. Britain and uh, France are the only two nuclear powers in the European Union. There is already a very high degree of cooperation between Britain and France in terms of uh, the nuclear forces. Uh, there's also been, and you saw it very clearly uh, with Libya, where the French and the British were actually acting together. Uh, now there was a lot of support from other countries as well. Germany is much more reluctant to go down that route because of the war, Second World War, and its constitutional position, which actually makes it, uh, it very much restricts the ability of Germany to act outside Germany's own borders. Although I welcome the fact that Germany has sent troops to Afghanistan and I also welcome the move in Germany away from a conscript army and armed forces to a professional army and armed forces. So I think you will find that there will be both in defence but also in foreign policy um, very important areas of commonality. Let me just end my answer by pointing out one very obvious one. Uh, and that is the relationship with China and the relationship with Russia. Now, every European country has a bilateral relationship with both Russia and China. But it's very much in our interests on energy and all sorts of other topics that we make it clear that there is also a European position. And I think we're having some success with that and that China and Russia, both of whom historically were very unwilling even to recognize the existence of the European Union, now take it extremely seriously. Well, Russia and China are part of the BRICS countries, new emerging powers. Um, how do you think the UK should build its foreign policy around these new powers in the current economic international context? Well, <laughs> first of all, um, Britain, but indeed every other country, has a huge interest in the momentum of economic growth in China. Uh, I don't know any big corporation, which uh, international, multinational corporation, which doesn't have a plan which embraces the China market. And even during this recession, China has continued to grow at 6-7%. And think of what the consequences would be if growth from China ceased. I mean, it would be disastrous, and not just for European countries, but also the United States. So I think we have to try and emphasize to the BRIC countries who are hugely economically significant, and they are generating most of the growth, um, that we do live in an interdependent world. I go to Russia a lot, I lecture at St. Petersburg State University, and I always say the same thing to them. Do remember that globalization is a two-way street. You can't just sit there and think that you can sell oil and gas and minerals uh, to the rest of the world without actually allowing stability in your own marketplace so that we can invest in Russia directly. And that's one of the big issues now Putin has been well, re-elected up to a point. Uh, but they have to 
persuade the rest of the world that there really can be the rule of law in Russia and that companies can, Western companies, can invest with security. Uh, China has got to move on human rights. Uh, these are very important issues and they're really the issues of interdependence. So we need them, but they also need us. But because we, we spoke about EU foreign policy as well, how should the fine balance between bilateral versus EU foreign policy be struck in relation to the so-called BRICS countries? And is it a matter of either or? No, I think it's both. I really do believe it's both. Uh, but I think you have to play both. And, uh, for example, the EU has very successfully negotiated uh, corporately trade agreements with the United States, more recently with Japan, uh, now with Korea, South Korea. Uh, and we have to arrive at these trade agreements, um, equivalent ones, with Russia and China. Now, that's that's going to be a major challenge. But that doesn't mean that British companies, for example, won't be going to China and doing their best to sell to China. And as you probably know, recently in India, there's real competition between the British and the French uh, in terms of selling to the um, Indian Air Force. So uh, I, I think you're going to have both. Your question was, what is the balance? Well, it may be that over the decades to come, the balance begins to move towards the single policy and away from the individual policies. But you're always going to have huge differences. And uh, let me just leave you with this thought, you see. Um, there is a special relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States. And it's based on history, it's based on language, it's based on being allies in two world wars. There are a lot of reasons for it. It has lots of ramifications, including security ramifications. I don't see uh, that special relationship going away. I think that's going to remain. I think France will have special relationships, and does, with Francophone countries. Um, Germany has a special relationship, to some extent, with Russia and with Middle Europe, Middle Europa. And I think you must expect that. And if you take your own country, Romania, which has more borders than pretty well anyone else, you know, of course, you also have special relationships. And I think that's inevitable. Well, as a final question, considering the tense relations within the EU, what regions or countries do you believe should be at the core of UK's foreign policy in the next few years? And could Africa be one of those regions, considering the UK's increasing lobby on African countries such as Somalia or Burma? And if so, why? Well, that's a hell of a question. I mean, <laughs> um, first of all, I'm going to sound very self-interested to you, but the Duke of Wellington once said that interests never lie. Mm -hmm. And uh, our attitude to Africa is very much influenced by interests, not just by idealism. And this country does a lot to try and alleviate poverty in Africa. But we have historical connections with Africa, particularly Southern Africa. Uh, we are very interested in some of the minerals and all of that. Now, of course, China equally views Africa in that way and so on. So. Um, I don't see Africa becoming the focal point. I, I think the focal point for Britain is the relationship we have with the European Union, and in particular with France and Germany, uh, the relationship with the United States, and uh, I think with the BRIC countries, they're all of them very important, but the two that matter most to Britain are India and China. Uh, China because of its enormous scale and momentum of growth. India also partly because uh, of the historic link and in particular the language. So um, there are a lot more people in India speaking English than there are people here speaking English. And the language dimension for Britain is really vital. Uh, the Queen, who's celebrating her 60th anniversary on the throne this year, has said of English that it's the golden thread that holds the Commonwealth together.
Well, I would say English is increasingly the global thread that holds the world together. It's become the working language of the global village. And I think that is tremendously important. That, uh, uh, that is a, a shared interest that we have with all the other English-speaking countries. Thank you very much. Not at all. <laughs> Thank you.